Wealth doesn't just happen. You have to go after it and build it. And the chase can be packed with thrills, frustration, and adventure. Join hosts Chris Sevigny and Jamie Bateman on a journey into mortgage notes, a little-known but fascinating type of real estate investing that's full of human drama and perfect for growing your IRA or savings. We build wealth by working with distressed borrowers who are fighting to keep their homes. And that's why we call it Good Deeds Note Investing. We're doing good and making money. Join us. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast. I am your co-host, Chris Seveny, along with Mr. Jamie Bateman. Jamie, how are you today? Doing well. How are you, Chris? I'm good. We finally got our new little setup now working, finally, after several failed attempts. I figured out what was going on for those watching this on video. Got a little new backdrop screen and so forth. We actually look somewhat professional, except my hair, of course. Somewhat. That's, that, yeah. And the fact that I'm in a different room in the house. And <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, it's pretty neat. We finally got it working. Yeah. So it's I was watching the video. Make sure to check it out on Jamie's YouTube channel, Labrador Lending or Mind 70 Investments. So today we are going to be talking about what are we talking about today, Jamie? We are talking about the top things to look for when investing in a note fund. Yeah. We'll so call it. it is a little more geared toward uh, passive investors for this one. Yep. We'll say top five. But we may, throw in, we may throw in some bonus content as well, like we always like to do. Prior to that, though, Jamie, why don't you touch base with what you had going on this week? It actually was a pretty good week. I'm not going to complain as much as I normally do. The one thing I was going to touch on is we are selling an asset that looks to be a pretty good win for us. So I'm excited about that. We had purchased a loan about 10 months ago, modified it, and the borrower's been on uh, ACH ever since. And was paying before the the mod as well and we're selling that one so and also the the person who's buying it is pretty new to notes and i've kind of been helping him through the process a little bit and i've personally bought notes similar to what he's buying and it's it's been great for an ira or any kind of a tax advantaged account so i'm excited about it. it's going to be a big win all around and it's been good for the borrower good for us and good for the the note buyer so i'm excited cool so I got my new standing desk, so I'm actually standing up now. As you knew yesterday, I was a little <laughs> nice. more fired up and excited on one of our calls. Yeah, you were. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> I had to ask you how many cups of coffee you'd had. <laughs> yes. I was having a conversation last night with somebody and I said, yeah, I think Jamie got a little spooked by, I had like over eight hours worth of sleep the night before and stuff. So yeah, I was rip roaring ready to go. Uh, no, no, actually I, this, I like this, it. Yeah. This week, late last week, we closed on four more assets. I had some loans transferred to new servicing this week. I got a few QWRs need to respond from qualified written responses where a borrower may question or contest a debt. So you need to get your servicer and attorney coordinated to make sure those get responded accordingly. Now, one of them, well, maybe you shouldn't self-service. Uh, I do not self-service. Uh, actually, I, <laughs> that was a joke. Yes, I know. Uh, someone asked, told us we should not self-service, but I do actually. Actually, I self-service a post-settlement judgment that I do self-service because you no, know, basically the person just pays every month, so it's not you know have to comply with any of the CFPB stuff or anything along those lines. But that is something I do. Did get my calculator wrapped up for my membership site, so that is now operational on. Mac and Windows. And I know my first trial, there was a few hiccups. So I went back to the developer on that who created the software to license it. And I basically was like, okay, I'm just paying you get this thing working. <laughs> I, should, nice. I should know by now, just, you know, hire somebody to do many different things. Seriously, uh, that's, that's what you do, right? I mean, <laughs> you're not afraid to outsource. No, I, um, yeah, I'm not afraid to outsource anything, any way, shape or form. So I actually had one thing I'll mention, I had two good calls this week with two attorney firms in different states in the Midwest and the Southeast and stuff and kind of mid Northern Midwest as well, that just learning about their services, uh, trying to expand the portfolio of attorneys, everybody has access to and uses. And so that was another, it was a really good call yesterday with a firm that I thought was only licensed in one or two states. They actually practice in seven. So I'll probably toss a loan over to them to kind of see how they do. Test the waters a little bit. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, people who know me know I'm pretty, 
bunch of straight shooter I, I told them that so i've been working in my basement and my sister-in-law is actually she's moving into her new house this weekend she bought a house a few months ago and has been living down here and the, our cat basically is fascinated with her because our the cat's <laughs> like 18 19 years old so oh wow yeah so my wife brought the cat from Uzbekistan when she came over. So oh, wow. they've known the cat for a long time. So the cat, when she's here, comes to see like, where are you? And starts calling her a oh, little inside tidbit. The cat's more important than you are. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> oh, if it was, a, I mean, it's not even like a question of who's more important. So, ah, so Jamie, I digress as usual. So why don't we roll into some of the top five things to look for as part of a note fund? Sure. Let you go Number one, a competent and experienced manager. I say manager, it could be multiple managers, whoever's actually operating the fund. Yeah. So a few things that pop in my head on that is competent and experienced. Now, competent, of course, is I think self-explanatory. Experienced for me is somebody who's been in the business and understands a portfolio. They may not have ran a fund before, and that's not to me, a big negative. It's something that they got to adjust and grow to, but you do a little more due diligence on them to understand how they anticipate on managing a portfolio because managing one or three notes versus trying to manage 20 to 50 and that mix of performing and non-performing is a little more challenging, but it's something that can be overcome. I would rather rely on somebody who has done 50 notes or 100 notes and are on their first fund that somebody that starts a fund after five notes and may have done two of them and is on their third one. I'd rather have that experience with the asset class than with the fund management, because that is more somewhat of a business practice component to it, which again, there's some risk involved, but I think at the end of the day, if you know, we'll talk about some of the other characteristics to look for, I think it's something that's important, but not as important as actual experience. Are you an accredited investor looking for a preferred return with the potential for additional profit splits? Unlike other note funds, which offer limited returns, the Integrity Mortgage Note Fund offers investors the potential for greater returns by providing a preferred return with profit splits, all while being managed by experienced note investors, Chris Seveny and Jamie Bateman. To learn more about this investment opportunity, visit us at integritynotefund.com where integrity matters. I'll probably mention this two or three t more times during this episode, but to me, that whether you're investing in a note fund or multifamily syndication, whatever the asset class is, whatever passive, I guess, investment you're making, to me, the operator who's actually managing the day-to-day -day of the fund is the most critical piece. So you can do all the research you want on investing in notes or all the research you want on market conditions or, or whatever else is going on, the particular deal you're investing in, the particular notes you're buying. But at the end of the day, there does have to be a level of trust with that manager. And so to me, that's the key piece. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, trust is going to go a long way because people ask like, what's stopping me from losing all my money? What's stopping you from running mm -hmm. away with my money? And besides yeah. the laws, I mean, nothing. I mean, it's, yeah. you, you know, it's just yeah. like. No, I had like, a, it reminds me of, I've sold a partial, sold many partials, but uh, one partial that I sold was a guy asked me, well, what's, what's stopping you from reselling a partial on this, this same note, the same stream of payments. And at the end of the day, nothing. I could do it. You know, it's just, there is, there is a level of risk, I guess, and trust that's involved in the manager. So, you know. You can't take all the risk away. No. No. Like any investment. I mean, when you invest, I invested in WorldCom back in the day. I thought that was a great company to invest in. Guess what? Didn't work out. Uh, what I get for it? Lost everything. But yeah. you're right. There's nothing you can do to stop somebody. If they're going to basically do something illegal, then that's right. why you got to really, truly vet them and do extensive research on them. My self plug for this component is, you know, I do have on my website a downloadable little ebook on questions to ask and due diligence on sponsors, investors and people in real estate. Yeah. So let me let me ask you before we move on to the next one. When you did yeah. your first fund, um, mm -hmm. you hadn't done a fund before. Right. So yeah. what kind of research did people do on you or what do you think you brought to the table at that point? To, to help you get over the hump. Now you can say you've run multiple funds, but at that point, what was what were things looking like? Yeah, it was most, so it was a 506B. So it was people I had pre-existing relationships with. Got so it. it was people who had done JVs with me, who knew who I was and were comfortable knowing that I was looking out for their best interest. 
And that's really mm -hmm. what it comes down to. Some people who invested with, you know, I've had a few deals go bad and, you know, at the end of the day, I made them whole. And, mm -hmm. you know, basically they're like, hey, look, that's great, you know, we, and stuff. And they were happy with that, you know, mm -hmm. even though they wish they would have probably made more money, but then they continue to reinvest. And it's interesting because those that have done that have reaped the benefits as well. So, because that first fund yeah. has done very well. Yeah. And I think the fact that you had done a bunch of joint ventures and partials mm -hmm. and things like that speaks to the fact that you could probably make the leap and mm -hmm. run a fund. So yeah. I'll be honest with you, makes the, sense. the biggest challenge I had with the my, early on, some of the funds I did getting mm -hmm. the right balance of the waterfall, which we'll discuss later on and making sure that I'm not taking too much and I'm not giving away too much. So that's really one of the challenges in understanding the cash flows, which we'll talk about again later on. Mm -hmm. Okay. So second key thing to look for, if you're looking to invest in a note fund, mm -hmm. transparency, you want to speak to that? Yeah, I'll start. And I don't know many funds that are transparent. Honestly, a lot of them in the note space. Let me start by mm -hmm. that multifamily mm -hmm. deals. You know what you're buying. You know, I'm buying this mm -hmm. hundred unit apartment building. You know, a lot of that information is available. The note space yeah. is actually, it's very weird because people like, Oh, like they're investing in a black box, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. where's this going? You know, and that's one of the things that I think I've done a little, you know, I like to kind of differentiate myself and from funds and we've got, you know, integrity mortgage note fund that we recently mm -hmm. launched. And it's about transparency saying girls, guys, everyone who invests in this thing, you can see every single note that we're investing in, you know mm -hmm. what it is. A lot of the other funds, you have no idea. It's a black box. So yeah. I, I find that, you know, interesting that I'm surprised a little bit why more funds don't do that, honestly, mm -hmm. but I don't know, but I think it's something that's important just to understand if you're comfortable or not with it. Right. I've, and I've invested in, in certain funds, both in the note space and other asset classes, and they can vary wildly on not only, you know, even if the operator intends to be transparent about things, even if they're not specifically hiding something, how often they communicate or how they communicate is critical as well. And it helps that transparency factor. So I've had investments where they've gone well, but I didn't have as much communication as I would have liked or the portal was a different portal and I couldn't quite access what the investment actually was, you know, how it was performing at the time. So I think just having that access is critical helps. And even I'd, I'd rather take, I don't know about you, I'd rather take a slightly lower return if I have an idea what's going on with my money for <laughs> It's three years, you know, you know, that you know, gets to the whole return of capital versus return on capital. But I think transparency and communication go hand in hand. Yeah, I was going to touch base briefly on that communication standpoint on letting investors mm -hmm. know, you know, even though you may have a portal, just still sending something out, whether it's biweekly, monthly, mm -hmm. quarterly, you know, at minimum, I would think there'd be some type of quarterly reporting that, you know, you yeah. send basically when you pay, if you're paying a distribution quarterly, there's distribution, here's kind of what's going on. Here's kind right. of assets acquired, assets that we've sold off, something. Yeah, I have, I've have a, actually have a current investment that it's doing well and it's not in the note space, but I'll get a quarterly deposit and I, have no idea what it is and it's not mm -hmm. because i haven't tried and they do eventually respond but mm -hmm. you know is this 90 percent principal coming back to me is, well, you know mm -hmm. what is this and so i think and that's one of the things i've learned with especially with my joint ventures is kind of trying to time the communication of the reporting mm -hmm. with the actual payouts and deposits because that can be a little confusing for an investor if you're getting money and you don't know where it's coming from and my recommendation is people are looking at doing a fund, unless it's a performing note fund, mm -hmm. I would not pay distributions on a monthly basis. Just, you know, because by yeah. the time you get your books done and ready and everything, it's, I mean, there's a lot to do that on a performing right. note fund and with a preferred return, that's a lot easier to review versus the non-performing mm -hmm. because you've got expense, you've got a lot of moving pieces and parts. So just. Sure. Makes uh, sense. Yep. Okay. So, Number three, you know, make sure the fund based on economic conditions is supportable over the term of that fund. And that's one of the things that you mm -hmm. got to look for is what's the length of the fund? How long, what's a lockup period is of a term? How long is your money going to be mm -hmm. tied up? That's an important mm -hmm. thing to understand because right now, for example, the economy's pretty hot on housing, but if you're tied up in something for five years, 
Do you think it's going to be worth more in five years? Do you think it's going to be wor worth less? So that's something mm -hmm. to consider. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think, like we said, the, the operator is, in my mind, m the most important thing. But really, right under that is the asset class and what you're investing in. So to me, assessing the market condition speaks to comparing asset classes. That's for me. So nobody has a crystal ball, but I would assume, and by the way, none of this is investment advice <laughs> or legal <laughs> advice, but I'm taking the, the presumption that we are going to see an influx of non-performing loans in the next 12 to 24 months. Who knows if that definitely will be the case and we'll see. But to me, you know, housing, like you said, is, is really hot right now. I think the stock market's pretty frothy right now. So I think the economic conditions point to the fact that there will be, you know, a lot of it depends on government inter intervention, but there will likely be an influx of non-performing loans. And we've seen such a rise in the housing market that I think that equity protection will, for the most part, still be there. So you've got to look at kind of the macro economic factors as to should I be investing in a multifamily syndication or multifamily fund versus a note fund, you know, versus storage what facilities do you think that, or, you know, absolutely mobile home parks. And we've talked before, every asset class has pros and cons, but that's not a set in stone kind of thing. You've got to look at what's going on in the, the larger economic world, if you will. Yeah. Interesting. And I'm going to digress. When I was <laughs> taking one of my, it was global investments class at Georgetown. One of the things that was heavily focused on was logistics. And it was interesting because I never even thought about logistics, but it's mm. literally, I mean, it's shipping locations and central points for set up for a lot of these, you know, the whole shipping industry and logistics where, you know, Baltimore is a major hub, certain areas of South mm -hmm. America, and just where's stuff coming from? Where is it going? And what's the flow? I mean, everyone's seen what's happened with the Suez Canal you mm -hmm. know, recently yeah. and so forth. But in a lot of these major players in that business are buying up buildings and space in certain strategic areas, because as products continue to advance and technology advances, you know, that's, you know, going to be another major driver of investments, especially in some of the third world countries right now that are starting to develop. I just, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's just, when you look at the types of investments you can invest in, it's, you know, mm -hmm. that was one I never even thought of. And I'm like, just logistics in and of itself as a, as an asset class. Is, yeah. Or, uh, just whole, okay. you, know, you know, logistics and shipping, you know, between all these shipping companies because of Amazon and everything else, you know, that's come up, come aboard over the last five years. And, you know, that's, we had to do a case study on it. It was really, really interesting. Cause again, it was like notes five years ago. I didn't know you could notes was an asset class. You know, one year <laughs> mm -hmm. ago, I didn't know logistics was, you know, and shipping was a type of asset class. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, you got to be open to learning and asking questions and <laughs> so, <laughs> always expanding. So, yeah. okay. So let's world number four, which is the waterfall slash pay structure. And is there a preferred return? Is there upside potential? You know, what does mm -hmm. that look like? And yeah. there's many different characteristics and I'll let you start. Yeah. I mean, I think if you're an investor, it depends on what you're looking for, right? So if you have $10 million and you're really looking for just a protection, maybe, maybe you're not looking for that upside. But I think a lot of funds nowadays are probably paying what, maybe seven, eight percent preferred return and with no upside in, in the note mm -hmm. space anyway. Yep. So to me, it, I'd rather have a little bit of a potential for that upside. And so mm -hmm. I do want the preferred return, which kind of is a little bit safer, if you will. You know, you t they talk about the capital stack and like if you're investing in different asset classes, you can invest in equity, preferred equity, debt, mm -hmm. preferred equity is kind of a blend between the two. So in a sense, I would kind of equate our fund, the waterfall, almost like preferred equity in the sense of you know, you're getting a preferred return, a targeted preferred return, but there's also the chance for some upside on the sale of, of particular assets. So to me, I'd prefer to have a little bit of a blend. W what are your thoughts? Yeah. So I'll get several comments on this one. <laughs> uh, so I've tested basically several different components where I'd done one where it was a straight 50-50 split, you know, and say, hey, we're just going to split like, like a JV. Uh -huh. And what I found is non-accredited investors didn't mind that. Mm -hmm. Accredited investors want a preferred return. So yeah. I did kind of A-B test this. And so let's start with, okay, you start with a preferred return. Like you said, I've seen some that 
up. So one of the things I'll mention is when we say preferred return, these are projected, but you know, these aren't, you know, basically it's like, Hey, I could give you a 50% preferred return, but guess what? You're never going to get there. You know, you can make all the promises in the world. Yeah. Right. Can make, it I mean, mean whatever, it, it doesn't matter what goes on that piece of paper essentially for preferred return in a sense of, yeah, that's what you could get, but are you going to get it? So that goes back to the first one of the manager's experience. Mm -hmm. But like I said, I've seen some that go like up to 10% from that mm -hmm. perspective. So I think having that upside is preferred because it gives both a vested interest. I think it splits kind of that vested interest where the inv both parties get to share some of it. If it's only on one side, you know, is the manager, if it's not doing as well, going to take more risk to try and get a little more money from themselves because they might not be making anything. You right. know, and when I see yeah, so yeah. When I see 10% or up to, so I've done one that had initial 10% preferred return. I can mm -hmm. tell you as a manager, you're not making anything until mm -hmm. you start selling those assets or they start closing because you've got some performing in there and they'll provide mm -hmm. some type of return, but you also have right. manage, you have your management expenses and you know, mm -hmm. you get a, you, you'll get your management fee, but that's, you know, that's mm -hmm. not a lot. Right. So it's almost like buying performing notes at, 11% and then selling partials at 10%, you're going to make the money on the back end, but you're not making yeah. anything during yeah, the, right. the time of that, that partial. Yeah. So the other thing that was interesting in what we did that I thought was very unique and I like it. And, you know, honestly was we moved our management fee after the preferred return. So mm -hmm. truly shows like investors, Hey, you're the first one, you know, after expenses in the fund, your first, you know, money goes first out the door to you. So I mm -hmm. think that's critical. But one thing I want to just touch upon about management fee, and I find this interesting because, and this is my note and bolt for everybody, look at what it's based off of. And the reason I say that is you're like, well, it's a management fee. I've seen management fees based off of unpaid balance. I've seen them based off of the lower of the unpaid balance or fair market value. I've seen them based off of the assets under management. And here, let me give you an example. Let's say management fees 1%, which is low. Honestly, they're mm -hmm. typically in note space, two to 3%. You know, some people mm -hmm. may not charge one, but usually you'll see two to 3%. So let's say you raise a million bucks, you know, keep things simple and you're at 3% based on assets under management. That's a million bucks raised, 3%, quick 30 grand, okay? Mm -hmm. With that million dollars, if you had a million dollars, Jamie, you know, you'll save, you'll keep some of it for, you know, expenses, but. What's the UPB going to be on a million dollars of assets that you're buying? Yeah. I mean, I guess if you're doing say 75% of them or say two thirds of them are non-performing. Yeah. That's rough. Yeah. $1.8 million. Well, let's keep it nice and simple. 2 million. So, yeah, I mean, and, but here's the thing. You might buy a loan that has a $400,000 UPB, but the house is only worth 50,000, but they're still basing off a of UPB. Right. So let's just say it's double. All of a sudden mm -hmm. that 3% management fee isn't 30 grand. It's 60 grand. But right, right. When you look at how your returns are calculated, if the fund was making 10% on the million, it made 100, and then 60 goes to management fee, there's only 6% left. They're basically making, mm -hmm. they're doubling their management fee because your returns are based off of the amount of money you have to mm -hmm. invest. But if your management fee right. is based off of something else, you know, it's double. Yeah, no, that's, that's <laughs> a good point. You can't just say, what's the management fee? 3%, yeah. 2%. 3% what? So Right, right. Good point. Yeah. So, you know, it's one um, of those crazy little things I picked up when I was reading. So yeah. the other thing kind of just touch upon is in kind of, this is, I'll say kind of rolls into number, f I'll say five, I guess, mm -hmm. is the legalities of the risk involved. What do you mean by that? So what is at stake? You know, is it only your investment? Is mm -hmm. it, can they go after you personally? Uh, you know, how is the investor protected? Mm -hmm. You know, there's some that I've seen that have clawback language that say the sponsor, if given you profits and there was ever a problem at the end, they could claw back some of those profits. Can they leverage, which then would be a bank loan and were there personal guarantees involved with that? So mm -hmm. really understanding, you know, what is, you know, most people, I think would want to have it structured where what I have invested is the risk involved, you know, make sure there's right, nothing else. Right. You can't lose as an investor, as the, as the passive investor, you can't lose more than what you put in is what you're saying, right? Yes. So that okay. would be something that you definitely want to look for. You know, you know, honestly, this is something that I think surprises me a little bit that, you know, with a lot of investors that I work with, I don't think a lot of them have an attorney review the PPM. Hmm. Interesting. 
Yeah. So, I mean, I have my attorney review everything and anything. So I had a again, digression I moment. I need a little bell here for like a digression moment or you need to have one. <laughs> I had a borrower just send me a settlement agreement yesterday to basically resolve an issue. And one of my attorneys sends it over to me and says, hey, you okay with this? And I look at it and I'm like, reading this, I'm like, I can't believe my attorney hasn't like commented, like, why would you sign this? It's basically a settlement agreement that the guy has to pay me X amount of dollars to resolve a foreclosure case to basically buy out the loan. But if he doesn't make mm -hmm. the payment, then nothing happens. So it's like, <laughs> so what, what good's this agreement? It's like, great. I'm going to put on paper that here's what we agreed to. We're agreeing to a short payoff, but if I don't pay you, nothing happens. So it's essentially like an unsecured loan. I mean, it's yeah. Yeah. I mean, so there's, basically there's teeth you know, to it. Yeah. I took the, you know, I took the lion, Ryan Gallagher, and he went after it, shredded it like a uh, lion catching a gazelle. And, you know, basically we put <laughs> yeah. language in there that says, look, if you don't make the payment, basically you're in default and you're signing over your rights to the property. Basically, it's almost like a, it's like a deed in lieu written into the agreement if he doesn't pay me. Yeah. So yeah, now it's, it's actually a land more. contract. So it'll be a cancellation of a land contract. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. But, yeah. I can say, and you know, you and I are working on some other things as well and working with you, you do, you do definitely have your attorney review a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so that, which is, which is a good thing to be thorough and protected and mm -hmm. detail oriented. And, and Brian's not, not afraid to, no. to uh, make comments and he knows, he knows what, you know, what, changes to their documents are likely to get, get accepted. And he's also frankly, not, not afraid of a fight if it's warranted. No, but I mean, it's just, it's fairness of certain things. Like, yeah. you know, the indemnity agreements in most of these contracts that people sign are, you got to indemnify whoever you're paying for everything, but they don't have to indemnify you for anything. Perfect example, I was reviewing an agreement with a company that does document recording mm -hmm. and similar. I have to indemnify them for everything. But they basically don't, I mean, it's very limited. But then if there's mm -hmm. ever an issue, they're like, oh yeah, we, you're respon we'd only be responsible for like what you paid us the last two months or, you know, something along those lines. So, mm -hmm. I, so I go to, you know, Brian, I said, well, what happens if I'm in Florida, you know, or just a mm -hmm. note that's in a state that doesn't accept lost note affidavits or lost notes and they mm -hmm. lose the note? He's like... You get two months of whatever you paid them the last two months. I'm like, great. So if I paid wow. them 50 bucks to do nothing the last two months and they lose a hundred thousand dollar note. And I'm like, that's... they'd have insurance. And he's like, yeah, they would. And I'm like, but I don't get any of that. He's like, no. I'm like, that's yeah, pretty. The insurance is for them, not for yeah. you. I'm like, that's pretty scary. And he's like, yeah. And he's like, you want me to put something in there about it? And I'm like, well, of course. Yes. And he had already, he was joking <laughs> with me and stuff because he had already picked up on that. He quizzes me yeah. to see what I pick up on now because uh, <laughs> I always joke that I'm going to become an attorney in my next life or I'm just going to, now that I finish one schooling, I'll I get another one to be an attorney. But uh, no, that's wouldn't not Wouldn't be surprised. Case. No, I get, <laughs> no. no. <laughs> not yet. Not, yeah. well, I've, I said that, but you know, you never know. So I might just get fired up one day and just go become an attorney. I get pissed or off. Open enough. a law firm or something yeah. to manage. So what else, Jamie, we've kind of touched upon, I think I consider pretty much the top five things mm -hmm. in you know, a fund. What are some of the other things you think people should be, you know, looking yeah, so for? Any other last uh, minute tidbits? I mean, I think we've hit a lot. Competent and experienced manager, transparency and communication. Yeah. Number three is supportive economic conditions. Yep. Number four is upside potential or potential for split of excess dist distributions. Yep. And then the, number the five was yep. the, with the waterfall, right? And number five is the management fee. What is that based on? Mm -hmm. And then we threw in a couple other little tidbits. Mm -hmm. I think that covers it. I mean, do you, do you have anything else? No, I mean, again, look at, again, look through the documents. Like we mentioned, just because someone's going to say, hey, I'll give you 18% preferred return. Doesn't mean that you're going to get it. So right. look, understand, ask what is historical. Look at if it makes sense from that perspective. If the historical returns on notes are 20%, and somebody's giving you, you know, a 12% and then that doesn't include all the ancillary fees that you have to, you know, is it realistic? Somebody's running a million dollar fund. That seems, you know, I'm like kind of scratch my head, a 10, 20, $30 million fund. Yeah. Maybe it makes a little more sense depending on the asset class that they're buying, but 
Yeah, I'll mm-hmm. just kind of recap. I mean, my my view on whether again whether it's note funds or multifamily and any other as- any asset class, I think the the fund manager, the operator, is definitely number one. That's who yeah. you really need to do your due diligence on, no question. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's just and then number two to me is I guess market conditions asset class, economic conditions, what type of assets do you want to be investing in? Mm -hmm. And then number three, drill down to the particular deal or particular notes you might be buying. So big picture, that's how I view it. One, two, and three. I agree hundred percent. And my last note and bolt for this episode, then I'll let you get yours. You can't compare asset classes. You can't compare a multifamily fund to a note fund. They're completely different. The structure is different. The returns are going to be different. The length is going to be different. The risk is going to be different. It's like trying to compare a tech stock versus a Disney stock or something along those lines. I mean, they're two completely different asset classes and what, you know, the length, the term, everything is very different about them. And that's Mm -hmm. one of the things that I get asked a lot is, well, on a multifamily, I can get, you know, up to 18% and said, yes, your money's tied up for seven years. (laughs) <laughs> and it's a lot riskier because if when you go to liquidate refinance or something happens and rents are not stabilized, rents have gone down or you've had issues with the property, whatever may be the case, you're of much significant higher risk of losing mm-hmm. a significant amount of money as well. So, yeah. And if you've got a reward. good. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've compared notes with rental properties and you know hard real estate before and yeah, you can't compare the returns from one asset class to the other. It's an entirely different thing. Certain asset classes have inherent tax advantages. Mm-hmm. I think one reason people, frankly, with money may invest in in a note fund is diversification. I mean, okay. even though you are poten- you're getting some of the upside potentially, maybe you maybe they have an investment in other asset classes, so they want to also make one in in notes that helps diversify across asset classes. And you see a lot more investors using their self-directed IRA money with note funds, Mm -hmm. which if that's the case, review the PPM to see if the person or ask them if they're going to leverage, because if you use leverage, it basically pretty much blows out the whole, you know, good portion Mm -hmm. of the use of using a self-directed IRA. But I see a lot of people Mm -hmm. use that for note funds because on the multifamily, you're not getting the tax advantage anyways. So because it's self, you know, it's deferred, whereas in a note fund, you know, one of the unfortunate things is it's ordinary income. You know, and right. It's, yeah. You now that's one of the biggest hurdles I have with investors when they look to invest if they're using their own cash, you know, that are high net worth, they see it's ordinary income and they don't want to use their own cash. Yeah. I mean, we did the episode on top 10 reasons to invest in notes and then a follow up on reasons yeah. not to invest in notes. And I think that's one of the things hopefully that people appreciate mm-hmm. about our approach is that we tell mm-hmm. it like it is. There's, I mean, notes are amazing. I, I, I spend most of my, my time focused on notes, but there's no perfect asset class. Everything has pros and cons. So do your research. Yep. So number seven really. slash another note and bolt is understand the tax implications of the note fund. Absolutely. That's a, yeah. <laughs> that should be up Absolutely. on that list. <laughs> Taxes are important. <laughs> yep. What's your note and bolt, Mr. Bateman? I'll be honest. I was a little unprepared on this one. So I'm just going to say, please give us a review. It's a shameless plug. I can tell you as a listener of many podcasts, it's, I often do not leave a review. So I get it, right? It takes a little bit of a pain, but to the listeners out there that do appreciate the content that we're putting out, it really does help us if you can give us a review and we hopefully, hopefully that's five star, but if not, that's fine. But yeah, that's, that's my note and bolt for today. Yes. So, and you can leave that at, it's not iTunes anymore. It's Apple, Apple podcasts, Apple podcasts and on our website, I know on, on 70 Investments website, if you go to the mm-hmm. podcast, there's a if you click on subscribe, there's a link there that shows you how to leave a review. So yep. make it as easy as possible for you. Exactly. Um, cool. Any final thoughts before we wrap up this episode? No, I'm good. This has been good. Cool. Well, you already told people to leave us a review. If you're looking for more great content, you know, listen to the podcast, come join us over on Facebook at the uh, Notes and Bolts from Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast Group. Jamie's got his Labrador Lending YouTube page. I've got my 70 Investments YouTube page. Also, Integrity Mortgage Note Fund is our Mm -hmm. fund. If you go to uh, integritynotefund.com, you will also be able to check out what we're offering in our new fund that we just launched that has 
a preferred return with excess distributions and the preferred return varies depending on the investment amount. So make sure to check that out. We've got that launch. We've started raising money and we're going to start looking at our first uh, pool of assets acquire. So it's exciting. Absolutely. I'm excited about it. You don't look excited, Jamie. You look a little calm today. <laughs> you're, we went over this yesterday. You're the, you're the excited one. I keep us grounded. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> I was talking to somebody last night about that. And they're like, you know, you two guys, you know, are very different. Jamie's very well, like, funny. calm and stuff. And yeah. you're just like, <laughs> you know. Okay. So I'll give you a, real quickly a couple examples. I <laughs> I know we're wrapping up. My I played lacrosse in college and I would, I would score a goal and my coach would make fun of me because I'd go right back to the same, you know, the starting spot because I would, mm-hmm. I just, just, I expect that of myself, mm-hmm. to be honest, and it may yeah. sound cocky. I don't know, but it's like, that's my minimum threshold. It's to uh, succeed. So it doesn't, you know, I don't need to be too celebratory. And then another one, I just got the the second COVID shot and my wife was making fun of me because I claim I was in pain and not, (laughs) I was hurting a little bit, but she, she says I had the same face the whole time that I have all the time. So it is what it is, but I need that energy. I feed off Mm -hmm. of that energy that you bring to the table. So I think it's a good so, Good partnership. You know, I played uh, ball and baseball in high school and then did a little bit of baseball in college. So I was, uh, when I was quarterback my junior and senior year, it was the time right around Deion Sanders was also was my favorite athlete. <laughs> mm-hmm. And he was Deion incredible. Was, he was a little flashy. Oh yeah. So, Still is, uh, I think. <laughs> yes, actually he is. He used to have a show with his wife. That was pretty interesting. So I have some very old VHS tapes of stepping down sidelines. Um, What's interesting though, is I was very similar. Like I was, you know, an exceptional basketball player too, back in the day when I was younger and I would never celebrate. I would just, you know, basically, because my father was like, you're expected to do that, you know, and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, but football is a little bit different, you know, but but when I scored though, basically I turn, hand the ball to the official and just move on my way. I would never talk. I never talk smack. You know, I kind of would, you know, maybe showboat a little bit once in a while and so forth, but not, you know, I would never talk smack because I'm full of the opinion that if you do, it's going to come back at you. So, you know, I don't taunt people or anything like that. No, you talk, talk with your actions, you know, just go score again. Yeah. I'm more, (laughs) I mean, the reality is, especially now with business and some people they say things, but I'm just so focused on my business and like, just get out of my way. Cause I'm going. And if I offend somebody, I'm sorry. If I come mm-hmm. off as being a jerk, I'm sorry. I say it like I see it, but I'm just ultra focused. Cause I've got a few things going on one or two, maybe, <laughs> you know, 300 notes. <laughs> you you left else. out the word, you left out the word hundred, one or 200. Yeah. <laughs> so, going I mean, on. it's just like, I've like, I'm just ultra focused and, you know, yeah. I was joking with somebody last night. I made the comment. I said, Hey, when my day on this planet comes to an end and stuff, I can honestly say I left it all, you know, I didn't leave anything left on the table. You know, I went all yeah. out. So, and that's kind of, you know, type yeah, of I had a roommate in college that he was a power lifter. I may have mentioned this before, but he, he would always say, people would say, Oh, powerlifting is dangerous. It's bad for your knees to squat seven, 800, 900 pounds. And he would say, well, would you rather rust out or wear out? You know, it's, so it's yeah. like, just get after it and yeah. Yeah, you might have some, you may make some mistakes or get injured or something, but that's much better than having regret for having not tried and put your best foot forward. Yeah. So. Oh, I think we can wrap up this episode of the Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast. As always, everyone, go out and do some good deeds. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast. If you like what you just heard, feel free to share us with your friends and colleagues, as well as drop by iTunes and leave a rating or comment. You can visit our website at www.gooddeedsnoteinvesting.com to sign up for email updates for future shows and access all of our great content, including show transcripts, case studies, video tutorials, and more. Don't forget to join us next time for another episode on building your wealth and making a difference.